Hi, good afternoon. Um, as to introduce Nigel Preedy from Fraser Nash Consultancy. And the case today I'm going to talk about is um, in relation to catering cars. So I'm going to start with just some objectives of, of what we were looking at, the process we followed, some lessons we learned through that process, and just wrap up with some brief conclusions. So the background, we, we obviously know aerospace is very, very heavily embracing metal additive manufacture. If you were here this morning, you'd have seen a um, person from Airbus presenting about what they're doing. There's been lots and lots of mentions today about GE and how they're buying up the machine manufacturers to have end-to-end -end supply chain in-house. Obviously, in their case, their parts are extremely high value. If they can save a gram, it saves them thousands. So any weight saving is massively beneficial. So they're an area who can obviously really benefit from the advantages in terms of improved optimization of geometries that you can achieve only for additive manufacture. Now clearly other industries can have a similar benefit. Lots of industries want to save weight, integrate parts, reduce manufacturing times. But is there a sufficient cost benefit in areas where the value of individual parts is lower? So the case we've looked at here is niche automotive. So say it's catering cars. They're a low volume producer majority of their cars are sold to the consumer market, but they also have race cars as well. So the first step in the process was to identify exactly what part we were going to look at. So we went down to Caterham, had a look at their cars, talked through some of the areas where they had known issues. And the area they highlighted was uh, this component here, which is called the Dion tube. It's part of their rear suspension system. And um, historically, in the, in the past, they used to have problems with, with this end in particular where it would crack. They've dealt with that, they've um, improved the integrity, and at the moment it's fine. They don't have any problems with it breaking, but they do know it's overweight because they redesigned it largely through trial and error, a lot of engineering judgment. So it's a perfectly good design, but it's undoubtedly not the optimal design. So then the following steps is to look at the requirements capture, understand what was needed, design analysis, and then evaluate the cost benefit. And we'll go through that. So requirements capture. Um, certainly one thing we've learned with additive manufacturers, this is a really, really key step. It's a real tendency for engineers to jump straight to solutions, not really think about the problem independently. And if you've already got a solution in front of you, that very much drives your thinking. The big advantage of additive manufacturing and metal additive manufacturing is it frees up the design space. So you really can do something radically different. If you approach the problem thinking of what your current solution looks like, there's a real risk that you don't take those full benefits. You end up with something that is a bit compromised by, by your initial thinking. That said, this isn't the most complicated part in the world, so the requirements capture is relatively straightforward, but it's looking at the, the loads, the space envelope we've got to play with, and the uh, objectives that Caterham would have of a part, which are primarily to save weight, make the part at least as strong and ideally stronger as the, exist, uh, strong as the existing part, and also ideally to have something which has improved aesthetic appeal, because they want to sell this as a replacement part to people, so improved aesthetics might really help people buy it. Just a, a quote from Albert Einstein thrown there that if you have an hour to solve a problem, we spend 55 minutes thinking about the problem and five minutes thinking about the solution. I think my experience in most engineering is we tend to do the opposite and think about the problem for five minutes and then start creating solutions. And so if we do that, we really do risk compromising the benefit we could have got. So the next approach was to look at the um, redesign. And the first step there was to create a benchmark. So say, Caterham do most of their design by experience, trial and error, some really good engineering knowledge. But what that doesn't mean is they don't have a lot of analysis going on. And what we wanted to be able to do was say confidently any new solution was better from a strength point of view than the existing solution. So we started by benchmarking it by creating an FE model of the existing design and looking at some standard low cases of braking, acceleration, cornering, and bump. And one thing it did show was we were getting the high stresses in the areas where they do still occasionally have issues. So on their race cars, these parts are still replaced. They don't last full life on the race cars. And these are the areas where they see the initial cracking. So it gives credibility that our FE approach is indeed capturing the correct behaviors. So then taking the next step of the redesign. Again, if you saw the presentation this morning from the uh, chap from Airbus, he was talking a lot about topology optimization. And it's certainly an area that really lends itself to additive manufacture. The concept being that you can use an analysis method to 
determining where best to put a certain amount of material to achieve a given strength. So it achieves the lowest weight for a given strength. Again, what we said before about taking your current thinking, the other advantage using the numerical method over just a, a conventional design approach is it's not influenced by what it knows beforehand. It's a totally neutral approach and may create some new ideas. So here we weren't trying to get to the final product from the numerical simulation. We we're just trying to give ourselves ideas as to how we get there. And we've looked at different scopes of the redesign. So this first one was just looking at the end of the tube. The Dion tube actually has another component on the end called the Dion ear, and we've looked at that. And we can see in that case, we were talking about weight savings as much as 40 odd percent, um, which just shows how much material in that particular component is really not being used. Um, huge areas of very low stress in the initial design. We also looked at an integrated design, because another potential benefit is integrating multiple components. So this is three different components multi um, integrated together. Now, one problem we did have, which again goes back to conventional thinking, is this step from the numerical answer to the CAD. I had a, a CAD engineer doing some work for me there, and he is very used to designing for conventional parts. And you can very much see it in the output he was creating. He was trying to interpret this organic numerical solution back into something in CAD. And we, we lost a lot of the benefit immediately there, because that's how he knew to do CAD. And we'll see on the subsequent slide someone more able to do the better job there. The upshot of that is the weight saving we see here isn't actually huge, but the real weight saving is much higher because a lot of that was lost between these two steps here, and we can do better than that. So we then decided to take the most integrated solution forward because we thought there was more weight saving to be achieved. And this is what we came up with. So the top left is the original design. So it's the end of the tube, the Dion ear, and then there's also another bracket on there which holds the speed sensor. And on the right is our final design. So we've seen a weight saving of approximately 20%, coupled with quite a significant drop in peak stresses. And that's more than enough to compensate for any loss of material performance from an additive manufactured material versus the original material. We've also combined three parts, so simplified the assembly. And as I said at the beginning, one of Caterham's key issues is aesthetics for this part because they want to be able to sell it to people to replace their existing parts. And certainly my view is that's a, a significant enhancement in aesthetics. So what about the cost benefit? Because that was the original question. Well, that additive manufactured part would cost several times the original. The original was a fabric welded fabrication. It's mild steel, it's cheap. The additive manufactured part, it, I wouldn't like to say how many times more, but it was certainly a, a multiple. That said, what have we got in terms of benefits? Well, we've reduced stress. One major advantage of reducing the stress is if we're having a part that doesn't have a long enough life, as long as life is the car, we can get a, a benefit there because we're not having to replace it. So if it was twice the price and we only had to use half as many, it's paid for itself. Integrating parts. So this isn't a great example of that because it's a fairly simple assembly. But way, again, it's another way to achieve savings. And aesthetic appeal. The other part of it is how much can you sell it for. So if it's got greater aesthetic appeal, the sales price can go up. So even if the production price is higher, you can justify it on that side. So at the end of that, is this, is this a viable solution? Well, the unfortunate answer is that it, it isn't really in this particular case. We're competing with a really low cost original part, and the additive manufacturing solution today is just too expensive. But that's today, and we know prices are falling. So in a few years, I think that conclusion will change. And the other thing to note here is when we set out on this, we looked at what's the part where we can improve the engineering the most. We didn't start by saying, what's the part where we can improve the engineering and it will be cost effective? If I went back to the beginning, I'd choose a different part, and I'm certain we'd come to a conclusion of, yes, we can make this part viable. Even for a company like Caterham, or a small, low-volume manufacturer, they can make use of additive manufacturing today. Some other issues that they would need to consider, though. Repeatability and reliability are major concerns in metal additive manufacturing. It's a real concern that if you take the same part and manufacture it on two different days, it won't be quite the same. You manufacture it on two machines, it certainly won't have the same material properties. So also reliability material properties. If you do 100 parts in a row, are they all identical? No, they won't be quite. 
That said, this is really a question of confidence as much as anything else, and also knowing what, the, what that variability is, because you can always design for a lower bound if you can capture the variability. My background before I started looking at this is I had a composites background in aerospace. And if you went back 10 years, you'd have exactly those questions up on the board, and you'd have people saying, yeah, but we can't trust this. You made the same part with different people making it. It varies so much, we just can't use it. And today, the primary structure of all major aircraft is composites. So for me, they're questions of time, the questions of confidence being built. We know people are flying parts on planes. They've proven to themselves they can do this. It's now a question of proving to everybody else that, yes, this is sufficiently reliable and repeatable, that it's a mass market thing. Obviously, you need to think about production rate. How many are we making? Are you going to insource or outsource? Are you going to buy a machine? We talked about some costs before. The machines are extremely expensive, but obviously, there's lots of people who can make the part for you. If you insource, you can potentially make lots of different parts, but you're just looking at one type of part. And then the final thing that is key to certainly a company like Caterham is the customer confidence. They're not going to be able to sell the part if the customer doesn't trust it. We've seen a lot of hype around additive manufacture, and those who saw the presentation this morning saying, well, we've come off the top of the hype and we're down the bottom in despondency. I think it's possibly not that bad, but um, there's certainly work to be done to build the general public's confidence that these sorts of parts really would be equivalent to the existing parts they've already got. So what are the lessons learned? Well, the first is that additive manufacturing clearly does give you huge scope for the improvements in your design. You can do things with additive manufacturing that are impossible by any other means, and that opens up the whole possibility of real um, optimization of your geometry. The optimization software has been around for years, but the actual ability to apply it to most cases just hasn't been there. It's been too difficult to manufacture. Again, going back to my aerospace experience, I was at Airbus, I've been using optimization technologies for 10 years, but they weren't really seeing huge benefits in the weight savings because they're going to conventional manufacturing processes, and at that point, all the benefits they designed in the start, they were having to lose as they redesigned it to manufacture it. AM prevents that, so that's a real, real benefit. But if you're going to take the advantage of it, well, you need to be robust up front. It's no good taking your existing mindset into the design because you will end up with what you started with, with additive manufacturing, so it'll probably be more expensive. So that doesn't make sense. You've got to start by being really clear about what your real drivers are and then coming up with the best possible solution, taking full advantage of additive manufacturing. So I didn't really mention in pass passing was as I went through my various designs, I was jumping through about four different software packages. There's lots of software providers who insist they have an end-to-end -end joined up solution. And I was talking to one earlier this afternoon. Um, I, I maybe they do now, but six months ago, it wasn't really there. That's certainly improving dramatically, and there's lots of people promising it. So no doubt, that sort of problem will go away and make it much, much easier for people to adopt the technology. Well, I've mentioned cost quite a lot. So cost is high, but we know it's falling. So again, that helps. I mentioned the other barriers about repeatability, reliability. But again, for me, that's all about confidence, and that confidence is building. So answer the original question, is the potential for other techno um, industries to adopt additive manufacturing? Yes, absolutely. It really is quite broad, the companies who could be adopting this now, and if not now, soon. So a few final conclusions. So we've come up with improved design. It clearly met the design requirements, the engineering requirements, but it wasn't cost effective today. If we go forward a few years, that will be cost effective. Have we looked at another part? Have we started knowing at, the end, knowing at the beginning what we knew at the end? We could have found a part that would have been cost effective today. But for me, the main thing I really concluded from this was, even if the answer is today, this isn't the right thing for your product, the rate at which adoption is increasing, confidence is building, prices are falling, now's the time to position yourself. Understand what you could do with this technology and at what price it would be viable to you. So at the point in the future where the price falls low enough, the confidence is high enough, you adopt at the right time. Thank you.